Hello everyone, um, thank you very much for joining us today and welcome to Hope Farm's second webinar of 2022 and where we're here to talk about elms and future funding for nature friendly farming. Um, I'm Georgie Bray and I'm the farm manager here at Hope Farm. Um, it's great to be joined by a right mix of farmers, conservationists, scientists, um, people working in policy and all sorts of um, different vocations as well. So great to have uh, diversity in the room here today. Um, last year we did actually hold a future funding webinar so it may seem odd to repeat this topic perhaps um, but things are changing quickly at the moment and there is definitely a thirst of knowledge to see what's going on and how people can secure their um, farm businesses for nature and future sustainable farming, uh, both environmentally and economically. And so that's why we're holding uh, this talk today. Um, I'm looking forward to introducing the speakers that have some really great things lined up for you all. Uh, but first I've got a few housekeeping points. Um, so the session will be recorded and available to view after the webinar on the um, Farm Wildlife YouTube channel and uh, previous webinars are all up there as well. Um, they will be, links will also be sent out to you after the webinar for those. Um, as this is a webinar, your video and audio have been disabled. However, you still have full use of the Q&A box to answer your, um, to get your questions answered. You'll find the Q&A box at the bottom of your screens. So please do post any questions you have throughout the presentations um, and they, the Q&A box will be monitored by my colleagues. And we will then answer all questions once presentations are finished. Um, please note that depending on time, we may not get through all of the questions, in which case we will, um, look at those at the end of, or after the webinar and get back to you after the event with a response. And um, finally, before we start, I would just like to say a big thank you to all the speakers and everybody behind the scenes to help produce what will hopefully be another very successful webinar. Um, so this year, our webinars are reflecting the positive way that farming can go um, from now on in, in the UK. Um, looking at nature friendly farming that also aims to reduce its carbon footprint. We're tackling some of the key questions, looking at obstacles that stand in agriculture's way of contributing to net zero and the nature crisis. Um, and this is all very well and good looking at these answers, but something that is needed to make a change on a large scale is support. And that's support both in terms of knowledge exchange, helping for future planning, and in some kind of cases, financial support as well. Um, of course, financial support to farmers in the UK is changing drastically from area based payments um, and the voluntary stewardship schemes to payments for public goods. There's a lot to navigate, a lot to unpick and um, push further before we have a new set of funding schemes across, across all countries that are fit for purpose. So I'm certainly not the expert in the room when it comes to this and all of the above, um, but that's why we've got loads of brilliant speakers with us today. And for that, I'm very grateful for welcoming them all into the room. I'm looking forward to hearing some short and sharp talks from those working at high level and driving the direction to support and improve farming for the future, followed by a deep dive into what that means for farmers in the ground and for their business, and finally wrapped up with some practical advice on what can be done on farmland near you. Um, at Hope Farm, we've moved with the times best we can to demonstrate the use of current funding and marketing opportunities um, to farm with nature. 15 years ago, that meant diversifying our rotation and entering into an entry level stewardship scheme. Now that means cutting insecticides, reducing other inputs and putting 15% of our land's conservation habitats. This is all within the fair to nature um, scheme. And looking forward, we're including agroforestry as an opportunity whilst running that as a trial as well, uh, but more on that on the webinar next month. So with that, um, making, so with that, what making the most of agricultural funding for nature friendly farming means to us, um, I sit with anticipation, wanting to know what we should be striving for in the future and what opportunities are out there and what we could improve still. Um, to help farmers work in a sustainable way, both for nature and for economics. 
So without further ado, I'll now introduce Vicky Hurd. Um, Vicky is an award-winning expert, author, strategics, and senior manager who's been working on the environment, food and farming issues for over 30 years. As part-time head of the sustainable farming at Sustain, Vicky manages the farm team, policy, research, and related campaigning to provide comment and guidance on these issues. Vicky's also got a cracking new book, Rebugging the Planet, and published in September last year, which is a homage to insects and other invertebrates and why they're so essential to our ecosystem and what we can do to help them. She's launched a major food and environmental and campaign, sorry, for local, global, in scope, and has blogged frequently and published numerous reports and articles on the sustainability of food, food systems. So with that, I'm very excited to say that Vicky is going to share her thoughts on elms and wider policy issues and local food systems infrastructure, fairer supply chains, trade policy, and how these affect farmers' ability to farm with nature and help to combat the climate crisis while still making a living. Good luck fitting all of that into 12 minutes, <laughs> Vicky. So I best hand over to you now. Thanks very much, Georgina. And I, I'm looking behind you with um, great fondness because I, the last time I came to Hope Farm, I was able to actually meet a um, owl chick, which was being, happened to be being ringed at the time I was there. So it was um, <laughs> extremely wonderful to do that. Um, so I must visit again soon. Oh, um, I have got some, yeah, I've got some slides to show you. Um, apologies if the, a bit, uh, it's a bit too much, but I'll try and fit it all into the time I've got. Um, and we'll just kick off with, um, hopefully that will work. There we go. So Elms and Future Nature Friendly Farming, um, as Georgina said, I head of farming at Sustain and I wrote this book, just a bit of a plug there, um, came out last year, but it does cover farming and food as well as you expect, but all sorts of other ways in which we could um, help the invertebrates that help us. Um, so just a little bit about Sustain, very little, these are, this is a slide of our membership and our objectives. We're working to improve um, food farming, fishing policy and practice in all sorts of ways. We do a lot of lobbying and parliamentary work. And I sit on the engagement group of the ELMS um, programme at, at um, DEFRA and have done for a long time alongside people at uh, RSPB and other members of SUSTAIN trying to um, guide it with our, our knowledge and the members knowledge and trying to make it um, the kind of thing that really will provide a revolutionary and working system to support farming. And the key areas that need action in that, clearly, in order to make farming sustainable in the long term, we need a decarbonisation. I, I always say this first because it's not about farming, it's, but we need climate change tackled. And so we need lifestyles, transport, industry, etc., to be decarbonised, to allow farming to do what it does best, which is produce food and adaptation measures in, in farming as well. Um, and we need to have greenhouse gas mitigation in food and farming um, pro whilst prioritizing nature, prioritizing nature outcomes too. Um, so it's, it's in order to support food and farming, we need to tackle climate change everywhere. But there are greenhouse gas emissions from the industry, which we need to tackle. Um, and we see the future as being around whole farm agroecological approaches, make it the norm, let every farmer get on the ladder towards that. And I'll explain a bit about what that means. But we also, alongside that, need to build an alternative food system, including better routes to market. So farmers actually have a decent, responsive, rewarding marketplace. And that will require new diets, people to transition to new diets over time, which reflect agroecological farming, so agroecological diets. Just a word about the climate impacts of agriculture. 34% of global emissions are from the food and land use sector. It's hugely part of the problem. And this is a picture of a, a great um, agroecological farmer I met when I went out to Paraguay. And behind him is a, a vast, as far as the eye could see and beyond, plantation of soya. And a lot of that soya is imported into countries like the UK, Europe, to feed our um, industrial livestock system. So we are undermining his ability because a lot of his land has been taken by Brazilian um, corporations to produce a monocrop of soya to feed 
industrial factory farming systems and stopping him with his, he had a wonderful agroecological and agroforestry enterprise, which is undermined as was all those around him. So this is a global issue through which we are affecting greenhouse gas emissions and biodiversity loss globally, and all of it needs to change. And obviously the rest of the supply chain has a big impact on um, greenhouse gas emissions as well, but it's agricultural and land use um, and the activities on the land that have the biggest impact. So to support farmers in tackling all these issues, and we see all the issues as being part of the same problem, so climate, nature, um, pollution of water, soil and air, um, plus issues around um, uh, fair, decent working conditions and decent livelihoods being all together. But that means we've got to have investment in the environmental land management scheme, which replaces the um, common agricultural policy. And um, in the agricultural transmission plans, apologies for the um, three letter acronyms which abound in this world, but the agricultural transition plan is the wider group of policies which are um, supporting farmers as we go towards a new era of farm support as the basic payments for youth schemes are reduced. And um, we see that there is a strong interest in DEFRA and obviously a strong interest in, in the um, wider stakeholder community to do the kind of things which will make a big difference. And I've just included a few here, using fewer um, artificial um, fertilizers, building soil cover and fertility into the system um, with more rotations, mixed farming, having less of the specialized monocrop kind of farming that we've invested in over the last 50 years and using different better breeds that are more suited to the land, to the environment. Um, water saving and protection goes without saying. All, all these kind of things are being talked about and a lot of them are in the new package. Um, and happily organic, a support for organic is in the new package, although it's not absolutely definite yet, but we want to see organic um, production growing in the UK. It's still very small, but we want all of the farming systems to, to be able to go on the uh, transition to agroecological systems, which are working with nature um, and a more mixed and more diverse systems using more legumes, for instance, more pulses, which are nitrogen fixing crops and can be a fantastic part of a, a rotation, but which um, can also um, provide part of the protein in a, in a system, um, replacing possibly imported protein crops for feeds or for food. And IPM, integrated pest management, critical to move away from the very heavily pesticide dependent um, systems we've got now, but that will require um, a wider industry change and change to diets. And agro, um, and Animal Health and Welfare, AH and W, I shouldn't use these acronyms, apologies. We need to be seeing this as part of a, a whole system where the livestock um, uh, transition is part of the whole elms transition as well. So animals are used where it's best to use them and using the um, crops in, and uh, grass, grassland in a way that's sustainable. And obviously we need to invest in nature-based solutions on the farm. Um, and I, I won't go into detail, I'm sure others will um, on this session. Um, but it does include nutrient planning, cutting use of fertilizers and, and having nature-based solutions which um, store carbon in the soil, in trees, in the whole system and, and, and restoring nature where it shouldn't be being um, cultivated. And a few more areas there, to, you know, you resilient breeds of crops and livestock, we're trying to get DEFRA to support within the ELMS um, uh, schemes themselves, um, support farmers who want to use different crops um, and traditional or native breeds of livestock, which fit a better system um, that is more sustainable. And overarching all that, we've got such pressure on the land. We need to develop a land use strategy because the pressure is just gonna get ever greater. And I might touch on that if I've got time. The environmental land management scheme, this looks like a very busy slide. Um, I think others are going to talk in more detail about the scheme. Um, the, the, you're probably aware that there's three components sustainable um, farming incentive, local nature recovery and landscape um, recovery. And that those three components are being developed and have been being developed over um, several years. The sustainable farming incentive has, has been launched um, in for all farmers in receipt of basic payment schemes. So basically all those farmers that are already part of the old um, European um, common agricultural policy scheme will have access to the sustainable finance incentive, farming incentive in the next few months. Um, there is also pilots going on ahead 
um, which are um, trying all sorts of aspects of achieving um, public goals. And those goals have been outlined in all the um, materials for the environmental land management schemes, clean and plentiful water, air, beauty, heritage, nature, mitigation, and so on. So there's a big load of public goals, public goods that are expected to come from a completely new system of supporting farmers. Um, but it's very complicated. I, you know, I can't begin to sort of tell you in a few slides all the different elements, all the different pilots, what's happened so far, all the research, um, the methodology they're in, introducing for payments. Um, but overall, there are some things that we can conclude with where we are now. Um, and I'm, I'm always trying to be very positive about what's been going on because it's taken a long time to get where we are now. Mistakes have been made. But I know there is big effort by DEFRA um, and also in the other nations to develop schemes which are going to work and actually also ensure farmers have a viable future. But you've got a lot of political barriers to overcome on this. And this is more of the big picture um, area because we do have a cheap food policy and politics still. Um, the idea that we've got to have ever cheaper food whenever there's a crisis in terms of incomes, there's a call for cheaper food. And certainly parts of the government and others are calling for cheaper food from new trade deals. So we're pulling in food that's produced to different standards um, globally. And that's one of the drivers of um, one, one of the real threats that we think is ahead of us. These trade deals that we'll do, which will undermine our efforts to actually provide for, uh, food and farming sustainably here and help our farmers to do things right here that they'll be undermined by cheap food imports to produce to different standards. There's also the low budgets and ambitions for action. Um, that's one of the things that we're very worried about in, in the Sustain Alliance, that there's not enough money to actually help farmers to actually provide the kind of payments that farmers will be able to do what we want them to do and still earn a decent living. Um, and that's a real threat. And we want to see much bigger budgets for, for all the ELM schemes and also greater ambition. We want to see a, a clear ambition, which is how, how the schemes are ratcheting up. So you can start with a low ambition to get as many farmers in involved, supporting the better soil measures, supporting nature, etc. But it needs to go up. There needs to be a ratchet. Um, and farm, so farmers can plan how things are changing. There's also a lack of political understanding of, of how complex food systems are and what really drives the decision making processes on farm, which um, unfortunately a lot to do with the beyond the farm gate and the kind of prices and um, contracts that farmers get. And there's also poor recognition of how farming and food link to, to good health. And often that's because a lot of the unhealthy food, the unhealthiness of it is done beyond the farm gate as well. Um, but we need to see changes in what is produced and how it's processed in order to deliver better, healthier um, people, families and children. As I've also mentioned, one thing, big political barriers, free trade and the markets will deliver all that we need ideology, which is still very strong. And obviously there's, we're not against um, the markets and private support for, for good farming practices, but we know from long experience that that will not deliver what we need to tackle the climate and nature emergencies. We need intervention by governments through good regulation and good um, support and good advice and uh, other areas. Um, global equity goes without saying. So we have had some good successes just to go for what we have got right. The Agricultural Act does have public money for public goods approach and the environmental land management scheme, which you'll hear about a lot more um, from other speakers. That's amazing that we got that. Uh, it's a huge amount of um, support from a huge amount of NGOs. We also have fair dealing measures. These are measures which should be brought in to make sure the supply chain treats farmers and growers fairly. Um, we got that into the Agricultural Act, but they're coming very slowly. So we've got to nudge government a lot on that. And we do have, have a new Environment Act, Office of Environmental Protection, critical to replace the protections we had being part of Europe, but that's got to have true independence and enough resources to make sure that the baseline protection for the environment is properly enforced and resourced across the board. As I said, very poor trade policy. Um, we have a, a big wild west in terms of carbon credits. People are buying up land or paying farmers to grow trees um, and uh, with inadequate legal and quality frameworks. There's a huge risk for farmers here, huge risk for the wrong type of 
developments, you know, large scale plantations in areas which should be rewilded or a combination of, of wildness and farming, which, which is a possibility. Agroecological systems can actually hold a huge amount of biodiversity. So we prefer to see farming where, it, where it's best placed and not replaced by large, potentially very risky plantations. Um, and this is part of the big push for bioenergy and carbon capture and storage. All these pushes for false solutions um, that will not deliver um, renewable energy for us. Um, and then the food strategy. We have a, a brand new food strategy that was commissioned by Michael Gove when he was the Secretary of State and it arrived last year. And uh, we have yet to see the response by the government to that. And we want to see some really clear direction there. So as I said, we need strong targets and support and budgets to support all farmers in the transition and, um, and, and for it to work. And for it to work, it's got to pay. It's got to have the right kind of payment methodology. Um, we've got to have research and development that's farmer focused with the budget geared to agroecological transition. So and the, the huge amount of money going into very intensive, um, uh, potentially genetically engineered systems, which at this stage we know are not going to deliver for nature and climate because they're all about monoculture and intense farming systems. So put the research and development into farmer focused and farmer led um, schemes. And there are some fantastic initiatives out there which are doing that and we should be supporting them. Um, and, and to go with that, we need farmers to have affordable or ideally free in other nations, they have free advice, um, but definitely affordable advice and demonstration to help all the farmers, the thousands of farmers who've not done any of this before, any of the, these kind of transitions, they need advice, preferably from farmers are doing it, or real proper independent advices and all demonstration to show how it works. Um, we also need to see wider action on climate related to land use in our nationally determined contributions to climate um, commitments, climate targets, and as I said before, land use strategy. There's so many calls on land, and yet we don't have a central strategy to decide what's the best use of the land, should it be for housing or bioenergy or food or, you know, um, pony paddocks, whatever. There's such a huge, and that's just gonna get worse, particularly as we, as we have sea level rise and we have stresses in our, um, the areas where we actually import food from, because about 40% of the food that we eat is imported from other countries. And many of those areas are water stressed. So we need to have a land use strategy to use the land the best way for domestic food production, which is sustainable. Um, and that, you know, we need local government to get involved in this and include food in their climate and nature emergency. It's not just about transport, it's about land and food. And that can link in, sorry, Vicky. probably need me stop, yes? Sorry, yep, I'll give you one minute if that's one minute. okay. Okay, no problem. <laughs> National food strategy response. We're all waiting, bated breaths for this, but I don't think it's gonna be a great response, but it should be reducing the pressure on land by tackling food waste, creating a, um, a direction of travel for our diets, so we're eating less and better meat, more pulses, more sustainable and less junk. And with, that could be through food procurement standards for schools and hospitals. We should be setting really high standards using good British produce and dropping any mandate for bioenergy and biomass. Um, and just to end on the final thing, as I've mentioned before, our trade deals, um, they need to put climate, nature and health first. Um, as an example of confusion, on the final conclusion of the agriculture, the Australia trade deal, which was announced last, um, last the end of last year, James Rebanks tweeted, who's a, a, a very prominent farmer and uh, commentator. Yesterday was highly symbolic and very real. The principle of doing something better on our islands and rewarding and protecting it died. Farmers will draw a simple conclusion, intensify or die. Worst of all, yesterday we killed farmer goodwill and support for high regulation and ecological standards and regulation. All that, I hope is not true. He was seeing it from the worst case scenario, but he's a farmer and he does things really well. And this is really, you know, we've got to all wake up and MPPs need to know. We need to be telling MPs we don't want deals which undermine farmer, good farmer um, actions and uh, strong consumer protection. So a few of our reports we've done looking at beyond the farm gate supply chain measures that really are needed to make sure farm friendly supply chains support them in the transition and loads of other areas. So I, I'll end there. Hope that was a useful overview, top line overview.
that was that was brilliant. Thank you so much, Vicky. Um, I, I didn't want to stop you, so I'm I'm sorry about that. Okay, um, I could go on for a far too long. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it was great. It was brilliant to hear about the bigger picture and the responsibility. It's not just for the farmers, and it certainly doesn't mm -hmm. end at the farm gate. No, we've all got a responsibility here. Um, on what happens in the farm, um, in trading systems, in mm. what food we eat and what's available mm. in the markets as well. Yeah. Um, so it's a real whole systems approach yeah, and global exactly. as well. We really need mm. to work together on this. Mm. Um, of course, there's key things on farm that we can do and those agro mm. agroecological principles. Mm. Um, and you did also pick up on the issue of farmers potentially being undercut and the cheap food question is a really tricky one yeah and um, so I hope we get some questions in about that earlier because there's um a lot to unpick there yeah absolutely it's complex <laughs> everybody should recognize that complex. but everybody should be involved you know everybody can get political but, and also how they eat what they eat exactly mm. no exactly mm. uh, well thank you so much there um Vicky yeah for for kicking us off and I'm um, we're now going to move to uh, further towards the other end of the spectrum here and really look at a uh, farm scale business and I'm really glad now to introduce Nick Renison. Um, so Nick comes from a dairy farm originally on the Welsh borders and spent her, fir her first 10 years working within a family business milking cows and selling the product. Um, in the last 10 years she's taken on a venture with her husband um, to start a new business together up north. Um, Nature is at the heart of their business, which is more than reflected in her work on farm um, and as the nature on the Nature Friendly Farming Network steering group. Um, she's a fountain of knowledge when it comes to making a small nature friendly business um, on a farm pay. And it will be great to hear, well, it was great to hear what she um, spoke about at the Oxford Real Farming Conference as well earlier this year. Not wanting to spill any more beans, Nick, I'll now hand over to you. I'm not sure I'm a fountain of knowledge in any shape or form, but uh, <laughs> thanks very much for that. Um, yeah, well, um, thank you um, for asking me to do this. I, um, I'm going to tell you, well, I'm going to talk about our regenerative journey. I'm not sure I like the word journey, but, um, I, and I think it, it um, illustrates um, what's possible and with support what, what is even more possible. So um, yeah, so I'm Nick Renison and I um, farm with my husband, Paul, um, half an hour east of Penrith on the edge of the Pennines. And um, oh, so let me start my stopwatch. Oh. Um, so, oh, it's not moving forward, hang on. There we go. So um, this is our farm and um, we moved here in 2012. Um, we moved into a caravan in the yard. Um, we get battered by this thing called the Helmwind. Um, we managed to buy the farm, but uh, and part of the reason we, we've had to kind of think of our feet is because we are heavily borrowed um, with, a, with a huge mortgage. And so that, um, that has made us think differently. So, um, and we've also got two, two kids and, and they were very young when we, when we moved to the farm. So we stocked up with sheep when we came and at this point, and I said this today at the NFU conference, I was totally wanting to farm. I had no interest in the environment, I, I, no, no um, patience for environmentalists, no interest in soil, trees, bugs, I just wanted to farm. Um, so we stocked up with sheep and um, we had a very complicated indoor and an outdoor lambing system. Uh, we reared my parents' dairy heifers and we wintered some cattle. And this photo is at the top of the farm. So we've got a mixture of kind of um, grazing fields and this, this higher pasture. Um, so in um, late 2013, we were kind of thinking, God, this is going to be a tough old gig because um, the, the, the cash was quite tight. And um, Paul went to see the Nellis brothers who farm um, organically in um, Northumberland and they farm everything in rotation. So um, they've got cattle and sheep and, and pigs and it's all moving around. And I can remember him coming back and saying, what have we been doing? Um, why wasn't I taught this at college? And this rotational grazing thing is, is what, what we need to do. 
Um, and along the along the journey, 10 years long, is there's been some highs and lows. But the first thing, if you're going to do rotational grazing, your boundaries have to be right. And this is where the HLS scheme really came good for us. And it, it's it's been it's just worked really well. So we got lots of walling done and um, we put lots of we, we fenced off lots of little bits of fields that weren't that great and, and planted them um, and, and really increase the shelter because we do get battered by, by the helm wind. And, and if you look at this farm, it's, it's a relatively bleak looking Pennine farm. Um, and also hedges. And this is when I started to soften and realise that actually um, working with nature was a much better way to be. Um, but but this, this, this was, and this is, I think, what I struggled with. So we just obviously bought the farm and then we were fencing off this huge patch of land to plant a hedge. Um, that took some getting used to. Um, but, and also when you start planting trees, obviously everywhere's full of plastic tree guards and, and it's just, a, it's, it's a, I, I find it a pretty grim and depressing sight um, initially. But seven years later, this hedge is actually uh, in the top left corner, just being laid this week. It's, it, it, I'm, I'm so delighted w w when I see these photos because it's just, it just makes me want to do more planting. And there's, you know, you see the owls and there's, it's just teeming with life. Um, so just going back to the rotational grazing. Um, so the HLS helped us get the farm stock proof and I, I, I might be, you, lots of people on the call might know what the, um, the kind of principles around rotational grazing, but basically it's, it's um, thinking of, of the bison in North America and they, and they um, go onto a pot, pat, patch of land, they basically wee and poo, graze really hard and then they move on and that land gets a big long rest and that's pretty much what rotational grazing is so it's giving giving the roots plenty of time to get to, to positive energy in the roots and and giving it everything a rest period so with 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 rotational grazing you um have to think about your water you have to plan your your paddocks um we've got now a mains electric most of the way around the farm and there is a cost to that infrastructure. Um, and um, DEFRA have costed on to rotational grazing is, I think, the way forward. Well, I think it's the way forward for, um, for, for, gra for grazing animals. Uh, but th there is now grants available to, to kind of get started. Um, but what can happen is you, you kind of um, think of it as a as a, a thing you've got to fix in one fell swoop and you, you haven't so I if you if you haven't done it and you're farming you think I was just want to try this I would just start with one field put it in the put a fence across the middle and just move things back and two and you'll you'll start to um you'll start to get obsessed like we did um so this is um um, our farm is we have got another block of land but this this is the kind of main farm and you'll see the um the, the blue lines, um, they were semi-permanent fences that we put in. Um, but then when we get into the kind of, when we're rotating stuff, those red lines are um, electric fences. So they're, it's kind of a three, we, we've got like three acre paddocks. So when we split it up like this, and it's really flexible, we've got 50 three acre paddocks. So the idea is you, you're moving things every, um, at least every three days. We normally move things every one or two days. But what happened was um, we, with, with this type of grazing, you just suddenly grow loads more grass because this is how grass likes to grow with plenty of rest. So we did the farmer thing and we got lots more sheep. Um, we went up to 1200 sheep and, um, and then the wheels fell off. And we realised, um, and now I realise, looking back, that we created a monoculture um, of sheep and ryegrass. And um, yeah, monocultures don't work. So um, now, um, seven years later, we're very much a mixed farm. So we've got a small glamping enterprise. Uh, we've got a few sheep, 200 sheep. We've got a herd of Aberdeen Angus um, cattle. We've got pastured uh, poultry, a few pigs that when we sell the sausage and bacon. Um, and also we just, the berries are there just because nature now, we really think of it as past like an enterprise on the farm. We really do 
Um, Nick, I think you're breaking up a bit there. I'm worried about time. So this is just um, an example. Um, am I? Hang on. Am I? Am I here now? Yeah, no, you're Hello? good. The much better Am I with good? the video off. Sorry about that. Okay. Okay. So this is these are our meat chickens that we grow in the summer. And this is just an example of setting up an enterprise on a shoestring. We um, grow these for 12 weeks and we sell them um, locally. And um, it's a product that um, it, once people have tried one, it kind of sells itself. Um, so the other thing, I used to work for AHDB and I AHDB and I used to do costings for um, suckler herds and generally suckler herds it's their winter that that costs them um, and this is just some figures so we really try and make the winter period and the house period as, as short as it possibly can be so this is a group of and um, there was uh, like 35 cows and calves up here and they they were just grazing deferred deferred grazing um, and there were some hay bales there. And th these sums just kind of, they're very rough um, back of a fag packet sums really. But um, so those animals, when they're out, cost £25 a day. And when they're in, it's £150, £150 a day. So that's a huge, the longer we can keep things out, it's just a huge, huge um, advantage. So deferred grazing, I think is, for us, is the way forward. And this is just... Um, an example of the pastured eggs. Um, this this is a very low low in, low uh, cost starter enterprise for anyone, and in comparison to, I call it industrial free range, but in comparison to normal free range, it's a totally different product. These chickens, um, when it's not avian flu times, they eat a lot of a lot of grass, and. Um, when when I used to do the costings for to make thirteen thousand pound out of sheep is incredibly hard so um tiny enterprise low startup and i think it's a reasonable margin and so these follow the cows around the rotation so this is just just an example of um we we farm and we look after nature but we also kind of sell ourselves as producing really really good food and having a very much an open um uh, being very open to the public um so it's it's selling the story we're not organic but i i think we're very honest with our consumers and we so we don't use fertilizer we don't the, the cattle and sheep are 100 percent grass-fed and then my last slide um so the, the looking forward getting off farm and um farmer to farmer learning i think is absolutely crucial um, and it's not just going to see someone who you know when they're having a good day it's 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 picking it's talking to people when they're not having when things have gone wrong and discussing the mistakes and it's also surrounding yourself with positive people um i was at the nfu conference today and, and i um i think i'm probably in a different headspace i think than than some of those people there um i i think the the future is um uh, for us it's down the regenerative model and it's and it's looking to what we can do and it's thinking we can be the answer for for climate change rather than kind of fighting everything um and yeah just we, we've learned a, a tremendous amount through um youtube reading books and it's um it's i think it's this kind of farming is building momentum and that's it thank you very much <laughs> Super. Thank you very much for that, Nick. Um, it was, yeah, it's great to hear about the development of your thinking on the farm. Um, and I think the key things I got from there is diversification really is key. But we need to, there's a lot of information out there. And I'm sure you had to spend a lot of time getting the information together to get that holistic business approach to work. Um, and the more we can make that knowledge more accessible to farmers, I think all the better. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I think it's it's a journey, and um, it's it's. Um, I think once once you start on it, you you're on your way. But it's it's um, yeah, and it's it's all all in the mind, <laughs> all in the mind.
Brilliant. Um, great closing statement there. Uh, so next up and our final speaker, we have Andrew Holland. Um, Andrew is from the RSPB um, and has joined us following 28 years of farming, uh, managing the farm's agro-environment schemes, winning the Northern Region's Nature of Farming Award in 2008, and being voted as one of England's top 10 conservation farmers in 2011 by the RSPB. And so Andrew joined us, and after all that, very gladly joined us as a farmland advisor in 2013, um, and now works with farmers, landowners, gamekeepers, graziers across East Anglia, including the Brex, the Fens, and now grazing marshes in the Broads. Um, where he's advising on he's advise on stone curlews, farmland birds, arable flora, wintering wildfowl, and breeding waders and habitat management, of course. Um, so undertaking and advising agro-environment scheme applications, all to maximise the land for wildlife and habitats. Um, so with that, Andrew, I'm really looking forward to hearing um, your thoughts on how people can apply some core principles and make things work on farmland near them. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Georgie. Um, yeah, my task is to to um, see how agri environments can work with the farming business from an efficiency um, point of view. So what I've done is I've on the first slide is I've clearly explained that or tried to explain that um, farming as a business and elms or any other agri environment scheme is not a separate entity from the business. It is very much part of the business and should be treated as a whole. So when you're looking at putting different options in etc you need to think about the farm and how it'll work for the farm and that it's not actually you know they're not two separate things you've not got your business on one side and your agri-environment scheme on the other okay we'll move this on okay um so yeah what is what is your focus if you're you're looking at the new environmental land management scheme are you looking at protection so therefore you'd be looking at maybe soil or water protection or now looking at carbon and how you can store carbon and reduce your carbon footprint. Or would you be looking at biodiversity, the habitats that you have or looking at creating habitats or the wildlife that you've got on the, the farm already and how you can enhance that? Or are you also looking at the efficiency of the farm, which is what we're about today, is looking at the fertiliser use and the pesticide use. And also talking about time, because that's very much part of the efficiency side of it. And also fuel, which is, you know, all these are going up in cost, um, but they're all interlinked. So what I'm trying to, 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 to bring across is actually they are not two separate entities. They very much work as one. And it all leads to profit. At the end of the day, it's a business and you want to make a profit. But I've also put enjoyment in as well, because the enjoyment, I think, you know, coming from a farming um but from a farming life, you know, you need you enjoy it, what you know, from the wildlife point of view, but also from the farming point of view. So you've got your time, which is linked into it as well. But they are all interlinked. So you've got your soil, and you've got the wildlife that's in the soil, whether it be earthworms or different microorganisms within the soil. But then you've got your fertilizer and your pesticides, and that's linked to, you know, what can happen to your soil. So it is all very much linked together. It is. It isn't separate. So when you, you're looking um, at elms and you want to make it more efficient for your farm, how can you use it to your advantage? And there's lots of different ways to be able to do this. And I know many of you will have already thought about a lot of the ideas that are on the screen in front of you, whereas some of you are coming in a new maybe this time or you've only, you're only thinking about coming into an agro-environment scheme. And these are just our you know, thoughts that I always think of when I'm working with farmers and we're looking at going into a scheme. So these, some of these are quite um, crossed over and they're quite interlinked. So, for example, if I was to say, you know, look at the lower yielding areas, are they making a profit with the costs of everything that's gone up? Is that area actually making anything at all? If it's not making anything, well, maybe that's an area that you want to look at for a scheme to put into an option because it is a guaranteed income at the end of the day. Um, what about uh, small corners? So I put small corners in. You might get compaction within them small corners. Therefore, you've got a reduced yield or you've got overlap with 
um, fertilizers, spreaders, and and with the spraying applications. So you know, is is that something you need to think? We need to think about when we're, we're looking at making the farm efficient, but using um, elms to help you to do that. Um, people are very much looking now about improving soil and protecting the soils. So if you've got wind blow or you've got erosion. Um, from from water erosion on your soils you know can we can you start thinking about obviously poss possibly using cover crops to your advantage uh, through the through the scheme protecting water courses well that's that's been there for for a long while we want to make sure that the waters are kept clean so can you can you use that from um, an agri environment point of view by putting margins in on strength and straightening out awkward corners length um, that are a bit you know they're not quite as straight as they could be they go around a ditch edge and it's just awkward especially with the big machinery it's about the efficiency straightening these areas out to make it more time efficient but what about uh, pest control or integrated pest management you know farmers are starting to think about that side of things and can we use some of the margins that are full of beneficial insects that will then go out into the crop and help control the, the, the pests that we don't want in the fields. So, you know, thinking about margins or, or I put in, for example, telegraph poles. You know, you could use beetle banks through the center of the telegraph, telegraph pole route and put a margin on either side if the field's big enough. And then you've got your beneficials going into the center of the fields. These are things that, that need to be thought about when you're applying and trying to make the farm more efficient. Um, talking about grazing systems, are you an intensive system and do you want to look at an extensive grazing system so that actually it's more beneficial and the options would suit you more maybe. Um, black grass again is a problem in areas we've got the two year uh, sown legume mix which has helped control that so that again could make the farm more efficient by reducing the black grass over amount of, a certain amount of years and then being able to you put it back into reduction plus you're resting the, the resting the land a little bit as well at the same time um we're looking at soil runoff which i which i mentioned before what about irrigation use so some farmers are actually looking at the area that they can cover with their irrigation system and if you've got a say for example a boom um uh, irrigation system does it do it does it go into the corner and if it's a, a potato crop that needs irrigating is, are those potatoes are they actually being irrigated if they're not and they cost a lot of money to grow and the yield's not actually there is it worth taking out that area so that the you're making the your irrigation more efficient you want to be overlapping with irrigation i think it's something that is something that needs to be thought about especially in years to come when they're saying that the area people that the uh, rain's going to be there's not or there's not going to be as much rain it's going to be a lot drier maybe during the during the summer months although you wouldn't think so at the moment with the amount of rain we've been having um but it's a guaranteed income but you've got to make it fit around your farming system your farming system will be different than, the, than your neighbor's systems but also we want to make it count for wildlife so we we do need to provide bird food all out around the year we're not just talking about winter seed during the winter months we're looking at insects as well during the spring for young chicks and going into the summer we want to look at creating areas for, for pollinators uh, for the hoverflies and the bumblebees and the solitary bees so looking at uh, areas rich in uh, pollen and nectar as well safe nesting areas is really important whether that's for birds or for again for bees etc um, providing shelter um, across the farm, looking at the habitats that you've got on the farm and making them, making sure that they are uh, well looked after and well protected. But think about the, the connectivity as well with when you are actually looking at your applications. But which are options to choose? So whatever comes within the ecological, uh, within the ELMS um, package, there might be a wild pollinator and farm wildlife package within that. And if there is, something similar to that that's absolutely key for your um for your agreement you need to have a look at the species you've got on the farm as well and see if you can tailor them towards them particular species and the habitats that you've got you need to to to, re, to protect because that at the moment that's where your wildlife is on the farm and if they need restoring we'll use the agri environment scheme to help with that so choosing choosing the right options for your farm um every soil is different every farm's different got different soil types if you've got nice light soil then you'll be able to um have a cultivated margin like this this is not sown this is purely 
in the in the arable uh, soil itself. So it's thinking about what soil type you've got and what type of options would suit that. Your machinery, have you got large machinery? Can you actually manage the, the, the options? What's required within the options with the machinery that you've got? So these need to be thought about. And I've also put irrigation in again, just as a reminder that if you're putting options in, margins would, might be ideal, certain widths so that you can fit within your irrigation system. If you've got sloping fields, we don't want the, the, the soil being washed off. Maybe, you know, you think about that, not, uh, not all soil washed off fields goes into the water course. Some of it can go run down onto roads. So we're thinking about that as well. Uh, water courses need to be protected. And again, I talk about integrated pest management and how that can help the farm and make the farm more efficiency to hopefully in the end, end result is actually to reduce your insecticide use. So from a grassland perspective, I will just go through this briefly. Um, again, you've got different soil types, whether that's clay or, or peat. Um, your livestock, as we've mentioned before, different livestock breeds. If you've got um, sheep, you might have cattle or horses and fit that around, you know, the scheme around what you've actually got. And if you cut for hay or silage, you know, make sure that the options that you pick, you are allowed to be able to do that, make it fit um, within the system. Um, so your habitats, what have you've got already on, on the farm, make sure you protect them and you've got quite a range of different habitats. It's very rarely you go to a farm that's got nothing. Some occasionally you, you go to a farm and there are no habitats because it's just bordered by um, a little grass verge. Um, but if you have, make sure it's managed. If you want to create and restore, there's lots of options available um, to be able to do that. So consider it future management. Those that manage the options like a crop are the ones who make the biggest impact. You can always tell when you're driving around those farmers that look after their agri-environment options and those that don't. And the ones that are really making an effort to manage them really well are those that are going to make the difference in the long term. So how many options should you have? You need to think about this. Again, it's going back to the efficiency of, of, of the farm and how you can tie elms into this. Make sure when you, you um, undertake in your application that you don't put too many options in, that you can't manage them. You need to step back and think, right, can I manage that? We talk about time. Have you got the time to do that at the time that it needs to be doing to be done? Or will you be busy doing something else to so make sure that you don't take out, don't do too many options and that you have time to manage them correctly? That's really, really is important. And will blocks be better for you or would margins be best or will both? So margins, if you're looking at margins, they're very good for around water courses and for around your habitats etc but blocks might be benefit more beneficial if you're a bigger farm because the, the, you can manage them because you the, they're just easier for the machinery that you have but i put enjoyment in make sure you enjoy it you don't want to do a scheme uh, um and not enjoy it the whole idea is to enjoy it and make a difference and see that difference so use the whole farm so I talk about using the whole farm and talking about it as a landscape because many farms are a landscape in their own right. They're very large, the larger than a lot of reserves are. So when you're doing um, integrated pest management, you're not thinking about it in just one little area of the farm. You're looking at it across the farm and agri-environment options want to be the same. You want to spread them around the farm. You want to try and connect all the different ones you've got to allow the, the wildlife to be able to move around the farm by creating corridors or using the margins. And as I said, wildlife knows no borders. So for example, this oyster catcher is just as happy, uh, just as a, a home on grassland, arable or on salt marsh, that there is no boundaries. So it's allowing the species to be able to move around your farm. So talking about the, taking the next step, it's try, thinking about working with your neighbours, not just looking over the farm gate, working and talking to the farmer next door see what he's thinking of doing and hopefully he'll come or she will come to you to see what you're thinking of doing try and connect your buffer strips together there's a there's some farmers within the Breckland that are doing this it's going to be fantastic We're trying to connect eat all the buffer strips together on each individual field to allow wildlife to be able to move around are they next door creating some kind of habitat 
is this something that you could accommodate as well or have they already got a habitat that you could actually extend that, you know working on that that sort of um feel about it and what species are not only on your farm but what are in the area and can you attract them in it's thinking just a little bit further than your own holding your own farm and obviously thinking very much um about climate change as well that is you know coming into it as well is the habitats that you can create which will help offset some of the carbon that's been produced through the farm these are all things that need to you think about that can make the farm efficient and to help you manage it into the future thank you very much brilliant thank you andrew um so yeah as you said integration is key um and the environmental habitats they can really make business sense as well um, and it's great to hear about how that can all work to increase the farm's efficiency and stacking on different services and uh, both environmental and uh, food production and the relevant income there and that planning is key as well um, i'm going to try and keep things moving so i won't say any more than that before now moving on to the next part of the webinar which is the q a um, it's great already to have so many questions in from you all, so thank you for that and keep them coming. Um, and it's at this point that I'm going to introduce Martin and Alice, uh, Martin Lines and Alice Groom to join the discussion and hear them. And first of all, we're going to hear their musings about the future of nature friendly farming and funding. Um, and we'll start off with, please, with Alice Groom. Um, so Alice is Senior Policy Officer at the RSPB having worked in conservation for 10 years, mainly in policy roles. Um, the main focus of Alice's work is on the environmental land management schemes in England at the moment. Um, so I'd like to hear, please, on the topic of our webinar, Alice, a, I'm going to give you two minutes to share your thoughts. I, I would definitely, I would definitely uh, try not to speak for, for too long. Um, thanks for introducing me and really great to hear everyone um, who's spoken so far. So, um, yeah, very topical web webinar for me. It um, takes up a lot of a lot of my time um, thinking about um, how future environmental land management schemes can work. Um, the RSPB has been working to try and ensure that there are schemes to support environmental delivery on farm for about forty years now, um, and have learned a lot over that time. And they've tried. Um, we make sure that we sort of incorporate all that learning over the last. Um, four decades in, into trying to ensure that the latest iteration of schemes um, are as good as they can be. Um, the kind of um, primary sort of, like sort of the principles that we're sort of trying to ensure that the new environmental land management schemes follow um, is that they're effective for the environment, that they're practical for farmers, so that there's the things that farmers can deliver um, on their land and they're deliverable for government. So there are, there are kind of three key principles. Um, it's been, you know, it's, it's been quite a, a sort of a long and winding process in the development of these schemes and it, it, it's not yet over. Um, it's about six years since um, the UK voted to leave the European Union and we decided to move from the, the sort of the EU cap to the, the new sort of environmental land management schemes and new domestic policies and there's, there's sort of still a lot of work to do and I think um, I spoke at the webinar last year and I think we all hope that we'd be sort of further along the tracks than we than we are now um, but in the last year we have we have, you know, we have learned more. Um, we've had the launch of the sustainable farming incentive pilots, and over 900 farmers have uh, chosen to participate in those. And we've heard a little bit more about the local nature recovery and landscape recovery schemes, which are due for full, sort of full rollout in in 2024. So we'll be um, continuing to try and influence those um, and ensure that they. Um, are capable of um, meeting some of the really ambitious um, targets that government are setting um, to achieve net zero for, um, by 2050 and to halt the loss of species abundance by 2030. That's what I was going to say. Brilliant. Thank you, Alice. Um, so that's Alice's thoughts. Any questions you have stemming from that, please send them in as well. 
And next, just introducing Martin Lines here. So we've had a stellar talk from Nick from a livestock perspective. And now introducing uh, Martin Lines, who's chair of the Nature Friendly Farming Network, um, and also an arable contractor of uh, cropping at Hope Farm and our environmental um, habitats as well. And alongside other farms as part of his business and his own farm in South Cambridgeshire. Um, so we work on a contract farming agreement with him and have all sorts of ideas that we wish to put in place and they simply would not be possible without Martin's practical experience. So we're very grateful for that. Um, on his farm, in he's farmed insecticide free for nearly seven years now and farms around a thousand hectares in total, including yeah, his other contracted farms, as I said. Um, and it would now be great to hear from you, Martin, on your thoughts on future funding Elms and where things are going. Yeah, and thank you very much. And thank you for giving me the opportunity. Uh, just a slight question, a thousand hectares is a bit too much for what I want to do. A thousand acres is, is, is great. Uh, I don't want to be too greedy. <laughs> Let's introduce some more farmers into the landscape. Uh, but how can we help them? So for many of us, many farmers have been doing stewardship of, of different schemes in the past and actually of understanding the true value of nature and using it as an asset in the landscape. Many of our hands have been tied in the past and many of us are actually really excited to get on with Elms, but Elms was, was not really going to get going until 2024, 2025. Lots of it's still unclear. It's still to be built in this co-design framework that we are working in. So it's going to be slow stages and steps. What we have got is the soil standards for grassland and for arable coming you know, available this year. And unfortunately, we've seen on the announcement they've lost the ambition as it. We're told it's coming later, but instead of the three tiers, we're only getting the two. And the bottom is only slightly more than what you should be doing legally. So we're hearing many farmers saying they want more money for doing these options. This is one option of a range of packages and for many farmers, we still have the BPS, the old payment structure, being available to us, and that's being tailored off. So the money moves from the old system to the new. And we must remember the old system was an area-based payment, and what's coming is public money for public goods, rewarding me for the assets I have that enhance the environment, and I have a marketplace, hopefully a fair and true marketplace for the food I can sell, and then get public support for the assets we want. And that's where I'm really keen to make sure the funding stays within rewarding farmers in delivering environmental improvements. It's an environmental land management system, not an, a payment for farming. So we need to be rewarding farmers doing the best possible things for the best uh, targets for environment within, within those landscapes. And hopefully those three levels of ambitions within the SFI, within local nature recovery and landscape recovery, as land managers, as farmers, we get the opportunity to access all that delivery. And I really look forward to some questions. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that, Martin. Um, so now if I could welcome all the speakers uh, into the room. Uh, we have policy experts, fantastic arable and livestock nature friendly farmers and advisors at the table. And we also have Sophie Mott here, who's been keeping a sharp eye on all of your questions. What do you have in store for us, please, Sophie? Oh, you're on mute, I can't hear you, sorry. One moment, please. If not, I could take over the first question. No. Just while Sophie is figuring out her mic, we'll go to the first question, um, which is from, it is asking about the new Elms funding and whether it will incentivize farmers sufficiently towards adopting more nature-friendly farming practices and will it give them enough support? Um, so I think there's two angles to that, what the what farmers in the room think and um, what the guys in policy are thinking as well. I'm going to kick off first off with Vicky and get your thoughts on it, please. But if anyone else in the room 
um, do shout with your thoughts as well, please. Yeah, I think this is a really critical question. It needs to work. The, it needs to make sense for the bottom line so farmers can invest in all those wonderful things that um, uh, all the farmers have just been talking about, um, but without getting a, a big financial penalty. When they're so squeezed in the marketplace, they get such low prices and hard contracts, the, the kind of support from the taxpayer really needs to work. And I am worried that they're not, I'm hearing from a lot of farmers and farming organizations that the payment levels aren't currently going to be enough of incentive to do those kind of things. For instance, allocate space for nature or change how they're tackling pests or all those, those kind of things. So um, I think we need to all be very loud and part of a movement demanding of the government that they put more effort um, into this through through bigger budgets so they can pay the right amount um, and also um, that it's longer term we need to, farmers need to plan for the future so you know we've, we've got a real worry that uh, the budgets will be cut in a few years time you know with a new government or when the government starts to have trouble so all those kind of things we need we surety and a good payment levels to ensure that farmers do change their practices and can change their practices um, and it, it's up against a marketplace which is really harsh and it's not going to get better. We've got Amazon coming into the high street prices, you know, farm gate prices will be ever more squeezed, I fear. That's why we think it's really important to have alternative routes to market being built up through investment and um, uh, procurement, for instance, in, for schools and hospitals to buy those produce from good farmers. It's critical, really. Brilliant. Thank you for that, Vicky. Um, I'm now going to move on to Nick and then Martin to hear from both of you on your farm if you think that you're going to be supported enough and also uh, if you think Martin that your nature friendly farming network farmers are going to be supported to farm in a nature friendly way. Uh, yeah thanks Georgina. Um, I, we, we don't get um, a huge single farm payment um, uh, and um, so it's not kind of that I think we we can we've we've kind of set up the business now that we 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 can manage with that without well not without it but we can we can cope with the decline mm -hmm. um where where I'd like support is um the kind of thing we we need support with is so we have a lot of our meat processed so small abattoirs mm -hmm. it's it's enabling mm -hmm. um the type of farming that we do to actually happen so mm. we want to build a slurry store or we and we don't want much needed in the wider community really um has my internet gone again no can you hear me your video is uh, being shut off <laughs> oh, okay <laughs> yeah so it and it's I, and i guess for us it's the um innovative it's the innovative thinking mm. and um, what we do currently doesn't fit in a box. Um, mm. And that's where uh, schemes like FIPL, the Farming in Protected Landscapes, uh, um, which is a scheme within the ANOB, has, has been quite useful. Um, but I, I think DEFRA are quite into high tech and mm. robots, mm. and that doesn't really float my boat. Mm. Oh, <laughs> I don't know if, if, if it floats yours, Martin. <laughs> I'll hear from you next now, Martin, please. Um, I think technology has a place and I can use technology to carefully apply products, do things, but I think there's far too much money being thrown around at it uh, and for investment in, in slurry stores now when we actually need a change in farming practices. And we need to invest in knowledge and, and changing farming thinking and helping farmers transition to a different thing. I hear many farmers saying they're not going to engage with SFI, the soil standard, because it's not priced enough. For those right down at the bottom who've never done any good soil health practices, it's a long journey. They've got to do a lot. Uh, it may not value that a bit, but actually what they need to understand is the value in the action to their soil, to their business, to their viability. So we've seen money get thrown, but we actually we need to join that together with knowledge about how we make these new practices we're incentivizing farmers to do fit their business and actually then how do we add value around local slaughterhouses, local routes to market so we can diverse our, our productions uh, systems and our food systems. As an arable farmer, do I always need to grow arable crops? What else can I produce? I'm already introducing livestock and other products and some bees. 
we can diversify our landscape, which makes us more resilient. So I think that's sort of the key bit for me is how do we support the knowledge alongside some payments? Brilliant. Thank you for that, Martin. So and I think that's fair to say at Hope Farm, the things that have really helped our farming system be more regenerative, it's not technology based, it's agroecological principles. Um, so we need there needs to be more money, more knowledge um, and markets and things need to be sorted out as well among quite a few other things. Um, Sophie, I hope that your um, mic is now working to bring the next question in, if that's possible. No, okay, that's all right, don't worry, <laughs> never mind. Um, so I've now got a question, I'm going to head over to you, Alice. Um, somebody's asking if they were to lobby their um, local MP about the new round scheme, what would you advise um, for them to highlight? A few key points, please. I think the most important thing is about ensuring that the schemes are ambition, ambitious and clearly linked to environmental targets. So that, that's the best way to secure um, the funding pot and make sure that these schemes are seen as really good value for money, but also making sure that farming and nature are really integrated and getting those win-wins. So calling for ambition and ensuring that that DEFRA are absolutely committed to setting out uh, a set of environmental um, targets and goals that these schemes will deliver and that they'll make sure that they um, measure and monitor progress against those to just ensure that we're on track, ensure that this is delivering um, and that we're able to sort of tweak the schemes as and when we need to, to, to really make sure that they're successful. Brilliant. Thank you for that, Alice. Um, I now have a question on farmland birds. Um, oh, give me one second, please. Um, so when do you anticipate the farmland bird index rising? This is, of course, against the decline that we've seen um, since the 1960s. And how can we expect it um, to go with the current options and uptake nationally? I'm going to see, Andrew, what you think to that to start with, um, given your experience and phone and advising, and then I'll open it to the board in case anybody else has um, something to say on that as well. Yeah, um, it's a good question. I think if the, the, the bird seed mixes are delivering a lot of seed during the winter time, um, and that, that's key, so you want to make sure that you know, if you're sowing a bird seed mix, it's got plenty of seed on it. And if that seed, you know, is, is good viable seed, then the birds will feed on that quite well. But not only are the birds managing to survive the winter, it's also putting them in good condition for breeding as well. So it's really, you know, that is key. If you've got bird seed mixes, they've got to be, um, make sure you've got plenty of seed on them. And if it's a two year mix that you're using and you're finding that actually in the second year, it's not really got a lot of viable seed on it, then maybe it's a thought to drop down to a single year mix every year. I know that there's a bit more of a cost to that, um, but the idea is, is to deliver as much seed as you can, to feed as many birds as you can, so that those birds are then, like I said, in good condition for breeding. Because only by the birds being in good condition for breeding will we get more young. And then providing, you know, if you've got some nice margins, some nice flower margins full of insects and invertebrates, then that's good foraging food um, for the chicks, but also for the adults to take back to the chicks as well. And it's, it's uh, if, if every farmer, you know, can space those bird seed mixes out across the farm, if there is a neighbour next door that's not feed, you know, it has no scheme or has no bird seed mixes, then you will bring those birds in and they will feed up. And then when it comes to breeding season, they will then move out, you know, away from that farm across the landscape. Um, it's going to take time. And I know um, it's, there has been a steady decline, but I think the more that the, the mixes are sown and, and farmers going in and having a look at them to see if there is plenty of viable seed and then, um, looking at maybe you're looking at the supplementary feeding option as well, which is you can bolt on alongside um, to have time to be able to do that um, and do it properly, I think will increase 
the, the population over time. Thank you, Andrew. So it's all, it's hinging on being able to deliver a part on all of those parts of the bird's ecology, really. Yes. Um, yeah, very much so. Uh, um, if I could just, I was keen to come in on this one. It's a great question. Don't know who asked that. It's a great one. Um, but our conservation scientists at the RSPB have been have been crunching some numbers on this. And um, sorry, I can't really know that I'm not allowed to release any spoilers, but there is a paper that's going to be coming out that answers that exact question um, later on this year. So um, essentially, we've, we've had schemes out in the sort of the environment for, for some time and we've had schemes that and deliver those resources for um, farmland birds. So we understand um, the level of provision that they need at a farm scale. So sort of how much habitat and the mix of habitats at the farm scale. Um, but also we have a quite a good understanding of how many farmers need to provide that level of, of habitat as well. So no spoilers, but keep your eyes peeled because there will be a paper coming out and we really do hope to be able to promote that. Um, it's going through the peer review process at the moment, um, but it's a great paper and I, I really think it will help to try and to shape um, what the schemes look like in the future, if they're going to be successful. Thank you, Alice. And will that be out on the farming blog or the science blog on the website? Yeah, so when the paper's published, um, there will be, there will definitely be um, a science blog. We'll hope to get it up on the farming blog and um, yeah, so make sure that we really spread that out there so people can see it. Brilliant. Cool. So that that question to be answered further. Um, thank you for that, Alice. I'm now moving on to SFI and BPS payments disappearing. Um, so um, why is SFI implemented so close to BPS disappearing? Um, when so and this is all a question about the issues of farmers needing time to plan, surely. So. This is the fact that BPS is going whilst we haven't got the full scale of SFI in yet, which is going to make life quite difficult. Um, Martin, I'm going to head this, this conundrum over to you to start with and get your thoughts on it, please. Thank you. Um, so the Secretary of State, has, you know, we're having a progressive reduction in our BPS payments. We have actually known that target reduction for a number of years. So farmers have been able to plan that reduction. Um, and the Secretary of State has offered that for those that are having the BPS removed until 2024, the early offer of the sustainable farming incentive uh, to get some of, within the industry, they're saying getting some of that funding back. But it should be not look like getting funding back. It is looking at delivering the new outputs and outcomes society is asking us to deliver. So many farmers have been, understand it, and we're having something taken away and the new things being offered. And as the more goes, the more the offer gets. Um, and we've also got countrywide stewardship and other bits. So there are different funding stream, streams coming in and different things. It's just a very complicated market with up to 16 different funding pots available at the moment. And knowing what to do and what to plan and which is coming next, that's the problem at the moment, to plan a business beyond the next few years to sort of really drive your business forward. Brilliant. Thank you, Martin. Um, before opening to anybody else here, I'm aware that this is hopefully meant to be a bit of a debugging webinar, although we can't fix everything in an hour and a half. So where would you recommend people and farmers to go to try and unpick the best ways to go for those funding streams at the moment? Engage with some advice providers, uh, get talk to people, talk to other farmers, talk to other uh, farming networks, the Nature Friendly Farming Network and others, because and also engage with the DEFRA blogs. There's an awful lot of information coming out of DEFRA and it's easy accessed, about, e easy to access. But it's unfortunately some of the grants we get told about are coming next week. Well, if you're going to get a 40% grant for a piece of machinery, you need to find the other 60%. So it's about making sure you're hearing the grants available enough in the distance so you can plan your business. But plan a business, you know, have a structure where you want to deliver, but add diversity to your, to your landscape. Look at other options and there are some funding to deliver some of that. Martin, there's also the farm resilience 
funding providers are you, are you doing that um which is people can sign up to get um one-to-one -one support and uh, go to uh, seminars about this transition funded by defra brilliant thank you well, for worth signing up to those yeah um i'm going to move swiftly on now um I'm sorry, all of these questions we could probably talk about 15 minutes each um, for, but I'm going to now move on to somebody asking a question about universities and colleges. Um, someone who came out with an ag degree where it was all based on production, um, despite their love as a student for the love of nature and the environment. Um, so what do we think that universities and colleges could do here? I'm going to start with Andrew and then if anybody else wants to chip something in there then do pipe up as well please. Yep yeah, I think it, um, I know at Eastern College they did do um, a conservation module within the the agricultural module for the students um, so that's you know already already in there I think that's good I think a lot of colleges or universities you know need to look at this and um, it's certainly um, a main part of the or part of the business as i've said they are not separate entities they are one as a whole so um you need to you need to be very much included into into any uh, college degrees or any college courses um the wildlife side of things it's very it's very important okay thank you for that andrew and Can i just say a few words on this yeah um, this is one of my big bugbears um just in the last two weeks, I've I've um, I've had meetings um, about other things with two really well-known universities, both I kind of highly regarded as kind of up there in in the agricultural kind of sphere, and both of them um, were pretty clueless. I'm gonna I'm gonna be bold. They were clueless, really. They're they and I don't know. I my cynical side says that they're funded by big ag um but it's uh, i i i think that there's a, there's a college we've currently got a, a chap doing some work experience with us who's got a place this next september at schumacher college which i think is something to do with dartington martin might know about this but yes it, it is it is they got yeah, a new that, course yeah yeah and i that's that would be where I would be sending someone who was really into this. I just don't, I don't think, I think farmers are ahead of the universities. They just, they don't get it. And some of them are obsessed with, um, obsessed with carbon and they want to shove beef cattle in the shed and feed them grain and say how carbon efficient they are. Um, and I, I think it's, it's a real problem going forward and I think people um, are leaving university just like the question and then they kind of brainwashed and, and, and you are I mean when you're at college and then they come out and kind of see the light and then they have to relearn so I think it's a problem. Georgina Brilliant. can I just say there was a survey yeah. that um, I was I, I saw presented uh, about four years ago which surveyed all the courses you know agriculture courses for how much they were covering the kind of integrated whole farm systems and agroecological systems and sustainable farming and it, and there was an awful lot of lip service paid to it for when it when the surveyor dug deeper into what the courses were delivering is exactly as Nick Nick is saying it was it was real lip service and a lot of them were really not delivering on um, the kind of systems that we're talking about here so the, there is work to be done to to really lobby um, to to change those curriculum and provide those kind of um, uh, system-based approaches that uh, Nick is using, like um, the grazing, but many, many others, the integrated pest management using less pesticides, not just focusing on high-tech intensive systems. No, I, th I think that's very true. And I think where a lot of the money um, in agriculture is from a lot of the ag agrochemicals and things that are sold, a lot of these principles haven't got that tag to them. Um, it's great to see though that there is more research coming out and there's regenerative farming. We just need a lot of it and a lot of it quickly. So, and things to fast track their way through the education system. 
Um, so I've now got a question um, here. It's kind of on that knowledge basis again. Um, and whether anyone thinks that a blueprint farms around the country and showcasing regenerative practices would be a good idea. Um, who would fund and support these? So there's currently there's AHDB monitor farms and there are different things going around about monitor farming systems. Um, but it would be interesting to know what you guys think, um, what the panelists think about if there's enough, what more could be done and how these could be made more accessible perhaps. Um, so Alice, if you have any thoughts first, and then of course, if there's anybody else in the room who would like to pick that up, um, Martin and Nick with your exemplar farms, it'd be great to hear from you guys as well. Well, yeah, I personally would love to hear from um, Martin and Nick. I, I would just say absolutely need lots of peer-to-peer -peer learning and, um, I'm sure there are a lot of ex exemplar farms out there. Um, they need to create them. We just need to make sure that we're making the connections and it's something that we need to see DEFRA supporting through the new policies as well. Thank you, Alice. All right, Martin, you have your hand up. Fire away. Uh, um, if we really want to see a transition happen, farmers learn best from farmers. And there are many amazing farmers out there all doing different things we all can learn from. So it's, I, I, we've got to encourage DEFRA to put more support and funding into this kind of knowledge uh, exchanging and, and divide, you know, within the network, that's an opportunity and a, and, a, and a space we're aiming to move into, how we can facilitate that knowledge transfer using great farms. We have a list within membership of the offers that they can offer and how, who wants to engage. And I think that's where we've got to drive to get drive the thing forward is from bottom up. But we do need funding from come from government and also there's a lot of green funding out there that wants to support transition how do we make this work so it transitions all farms across the uk because each part of the uk are going at a different speed within their transfer of payments from a bps an area based to whatever's coming but all farmers can learn from each other so that's for me for what i'm passionate about is how do we stimulate this bottom-up approach and use you know, farmers that are doing good stuff to show other farmers. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, Nick, do you have any further to add to that before our final question? No, I, I, I think um, just as Alice said, I think the farms are already out there. I think it's just linking people up. And um, it's, it's quite often if you go to a, a group meeting, um, farmers maybe don't feel always feel comfortable in in coming forward in that in that kind of situation. So I think one to one and it, it is is a great um, model. And I think yeah, it's a shame because the trouble is we and, and Martin will know this. You you give give your time to people um, coming around, and it's and it's always you you always learn something from them. But if you're not careful, you if you do a few of those a week, they always go on for a couple of hours. And then you've got you're just behind with everything. So um, yeah, I, I think it's I think it's the funding, and then it's just simply map like be a website and mapping people up with people of, of where they want to go for different farms. But yeah. I think there is a, there is a funding gap. Um, no, agreed. We have quite a few people to our a farm uh, Hope Farm, and I certainly learn an awful lot from the people who come and visit. And I always say, if there's something that you think you could do better let me know and equally when we go over to other farms it's it's very different to going in a room in the farmer meetings that you would have to do for basis or Doroso points and those kind of things it's yeah. a very yeah. different situation um so the final question of the evening I've got now um there's a question here about um coordinating providing food and local supply chains to for local councils schools hospitals and those kind of things and making and i think this is all around making food and good food that is produced to a high standard much more accessible um vicky can i hear your thoughts on that please yeah it's absolutely critical i've, I've been working to try and get regulation to make the supermarkets behave better and the supply chain to over and i, I for years and and we're getting somewhere we've got some things but it's not it's not going to do what we need so we need to have these alternative routes to market really responsive farmer focused marketplaces and there there is a growth um of 
Better Food Traders. There's actually the Better Food Traders Network, which do have a look at their website. It, it's brilliant and it's growing all, all the time in terms of membership. And those members of the Better Food Traders Network are traders, but they have completely stronger principles of who they buy from and, and the money that should go to the farmers and the workers and to allow the land to be um, farmed in environmentally friendly ways. And their far, their farm shops, their veggie box schemes, all sorts, farmers markets. Um, so there is a growing network. And what we want to do um, through our um, work is to provide the bit in the middle to the government and others to support the development of the infrastructure, like the abattoirs that Nick talked about, um, drying, milling, processing, all the bits in between, plus the training and marketing hubs so that more farmers can get involved in doing in in more of these good trading networks and part of this the original question was about schools and hospitals sorry um there is i'm, I'm on an advisory group for something called dynamic procurement um dynamic food procurement and this is a a new tool using digital um systems to allow smes small farmers to actually feed into large procurement contracts because at the moment contracts are big players, big corporations, and you can't get looking if you've got, you know, a small um, amount of produce or if you want to diversify and feed local schools and hospitals. So dynamic procurement, they've got a new tool and there is funding to develop dynamic procurement in, in all regions through a particular foundation. So lots going on. Watch our website and blogs about that. Um, but dynamic procurement is, is an interesting new opportunity to actually do that right. But Brilliant. also we need lots of supply chain initiatives as well. Thank you, Vicky. And I think there's a, a link to that would be great to have in a response and a few other things that we've been talked about. Um, there is just one more question that's popped up that, Andrew, I would like to put to you um, before finishing the webinar. And that's, as it's quite a nice one to finish on, what do you think is the first point that a farmer could make who has not started on a regenerative farming journey yet? Um, or what could persuade them to take the first step? Right. <clears throat> okay. Um, good question. Um, maybe this would be better have gone to Martin. Um, from uh, regenerative agriculture, um, looking looking at the soils, um, I think. Um, yeah, I think I think I'd be better forwarding this to Martin. I think he's probably got more of an idea than than I have. If that's all, if that's all right, Georgie. I think. No, that's fine. I'll forward on to Martin. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Go and meet another farmer already doing something similar or doing some regenerative stuff. Go on social media, look on YouTube. There's an amazing amount of information out there. And then just look at where you are within your landscape, your business, your journey in, in, in farming, and look at what you can implement. Uh, there's loads of amazing farmers out there. I mean, we've heard Nick's story tonight of what they've implemented on their farm. It's, it's go and find them and have a conversation. Most of them are really good at wanting to share their knowledge and experience, the good and the bad. Uh, so do go and engage. Brilliant. And I, and I think that's something that is great about farmers. Anyone that we've spoken to and learned from, they will, they will share the good, the bad and the ugly. And I think that's so important. Um, can, I just, can I just add, I'd also, yeah. there's a book, yeah, there's a book called Dirt to Soil by Gay Brown. Um, I'd read that. I think it's a it, that's a common starting point for people. So yeah, gay brown dirt to soil. Brilliant. No, that, that, very true. I've I've got that sitting on my shelf here. <laughs> it's a brilliant book. Um, so with that, I would just like to say again to everybody. I said it at the beginning, but thank you again for um, joining us for this webinar and to the audience as well who's kicked up some fantastic questions and great discussions between all the panellists. Um, thank you to the RSPB events team who really are the, um, the cogs that helps to make this work, um, the panellists and the speakers as well. Uh, please do join us on the 16th of March for our final webinar on the 22 series and we'll be looking at agroforestry at that point. Um, people who have over 40 years of experience and us look, who are just getting started in the game and looking at how that might work for farming businesses. Um, I wish you all a good night and yes, hope to catch up with you next month.